Hi, I'm Len Epp from LeanPub, and in this LeanPub podcast, I'll be interviewing Heidi Helfand. Heidi is an organizational relationship systems coach, a consultant and speaker with over 17 years of experience working with cross-functional teams. She is also the author of the LeanPub book, Dynamic Reteaming, The Art and Wisdom of Changing Teams. It's a book that describes practices for reteaming effectively and at the same time offers great stories about how successful software companies have thrived by changing up their teams rather than keeping their teams the same. Uh, The book makes the interesting point that keeping teams static instead of dynamic actually carries risks related to attrition, learning, and other important elements of delivering great software in the long term. In this interview, we're going to talk about Heidi's career, her professional interests, her book, and at the end, we'll talk a little bit about her experience self-publishing an in-progress book. So thank you, Heidi, for being on the Lean Pub podcast. Sure. Happy to be here. Um, I usually like to start these interviews by asking people for uh, what I call their origin story. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you found your way to being a, a team coach. I know I, I, I looked you up on LinkedIn and saw that you um, uh, studied linguistics in university. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so I studied linguistics, and I studied linguistics in Spanish. It's actually how I discovered it. I wasn't sure what I wanted to major in in college, and so I kept taking Spanish classes, and I became interested in syntax and the grammar of languages through learning about it in Spanish. And then I thought, actually, as time passed on, I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm about to earn a degree in Spanish. I'm like a course away just because I kept following that. And then I thought, well, maybe I'll take some courses about linguistics and English. So I earned a double major in Spanish and linguistics and became very interested in the structure of languages. And one of the things that, that we would do in linguistics is study different languages and we'd have data sets from these languages. We'd transcribe them using the international phonetic alphabet. And then we'd study these data sets to see what patterns existed so that we could explain how the language systems worked. And so I was really fascinated in that and thought I would get a PhD in linguistics. And then after a little bit, I I talked to one of my professors and he said, you should really study applied linguistics because if you're going to get a PhD in theoretical syntax, you might want to be balanced with more of an applied approach as well, because then you'd be more marketable. You'd have a better chance of getting a professorship. So I said, okay. So then I went to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and I studied applied linguistics, specifically how to teach uh, different lang- te- teach English as a second language. And when I was at the University of Illinois, uh, it was an interesting time. Mark Andreessen was there as an undergrad at the NCSA. And I was teaching, I was teaching English in a computer lab. And one day, I was in the computer lab, and we had new software, and the software was called Mosaic. So it was at the beginning of the World Wide Web, right? And so I was teaching a English writing class in the computer lab, and suddenly, there was a big shift in my interest because HTML was just released. It was like HTML 1.0 or whatever we called it at that time. And just uh, kind of naturally, I started teaching people HTML and how to create, you know, writing through web page creation. So essentially, it was a merge of, of the teaching people English and kind of applying, you know, the language knowledge that I had, as well as how can we reach a larger audience with our writing? Well, there's this thing called the web now. And if we learn these, this markup language we can reach a larger audience. And so then my degree shifted to become computer assisted language learning and specifically how do we use uh, the internet as a tool for helping us learn English and for reaching a wider audience with our writing and doing things with reading, et cetera. And, you know, so that was the, the very beginning for me. And so I earned a master's in uh, teaching English I did a a master's thesis on using email in teaching English, and that I had to fight for because one of the professors thought that email was going to be a fad. And so I I wound up completing the degree, and then I started teaching at different uh, universities. I started teaching English, so I was at the University of New Orleans, and then I found my way to the University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, where I've I've stayed here for about 20 years now since then. 
And so my first career was in teaching English. I wrote a, I co-authored a book that's in print called Internet for English Teaching. It was published a few times and we gave it away for free through the uh, U.S. Department of State. We gave it away for free outside the U.S. And yeah, so my first career was in uh, using the, really using the internet as a tool for teaching language, uh, English in particular. And so I found myself in California. It's kind of a long story. <laughs> oh, no, it's an interesting story, actually. Um, uh, obviously, you know, the, there's something quite interesting about being there at the beginning of the web, at, you know, the same place where Mark Andreessen was. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, and I, I just wanted to mention, I think there are probably people listening to this who wish you, your professor had been right about email being a fad. <laughs> um, uh, but, um, you know, I, I, uh, in doing some research, I, um, I noted that you, you did a State Department project over, yeah. overseas for a month, I believe. It might have been in 1999. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that experience. I know it was about yeah. um, uh, American literature. Mm -hmm. um, I, have, I have a doctorate in English literature myself, and I, I oh, actually wow. remember in the mid-90s or the late-90s doing my master's. And, um, you know, this was a time of, it was a heady time in English literature with this whole internet thing mm -hmm. happening with all kinds of wild, even metaphysical theories about what a link was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that experience that you had um, uh, sure. uh, 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 using American literature um, to teach English, I believe was part of the project. Yeah, that, that was interesting. So I had started speaking at conferences in the space of uh, education and, and teaching with the internet. And, you know, we were, you know, back in the day, our online communities were really listservs, right? So we'd have these email lists, um, according to different topics. And um, I remember just, uh, you know, started meeting people online. And, I received an invitation at one point just from the exposure of being active on, on listservs at the time. I received an invitation by an e a regional English language officer in Malaysia. So he worked for the State Department. And at the time, I don't know if they still do this, they had regional English language officers across the world. And with specific sets of objectives, I think, related to uh you know, teaching English and, and, and what, and whatnot. And so I was invited, I went twice, I went twice to, uh, Peninsular and also East Malaysia, uh, top of Borneo. Uh, I went to Sarawak and Kota Kinabalu, Kuala Lumpur. Basically I was, uh, so I went twice and I had lecture tours in which I was teaching people how to create web pages on one of the tours, I worked with the Malaysian Ministry of Education, and I worked with them on building their first website. So I taught them HTML or whatever tools were around at that time and helped them create their first website. And then, so the first tour, I did not take any literature with me. The second tour, I was requested to take these. I had a few uh, anthologies of English literature. I have them actually in the other room here. And so the goal of the second trip, which is written up online somewhere, which was about sharing the English literature with the idea of creating websites uh, about the English literature. And the interesting thing emerged was that the students in the class, it was awesome. They brought uh, their Malaysian literature. And so I, the result was, I think, some sort of hybrid with literature from the U.S. and literature from Malaysia, if I recall. And, yeah, it was really a, a very interesting time, and I was delighted to be able to uh, have these two trips and to meet the, the teachers and to share. So I, I visited teacher training colleges. I was at the U.S. Embassy in Kuala Lumpur doing training. So it was basically I was mailed. We had paper air airplane tickets at that time. So for both trips, I was mailed a stack of airplane tickets. And then I was just turned loose and, and flew off to uh, Southeast Asia and went from place to place uh, teaching. And, you know, at that time, 
you know, I would teach about the internet without the internet because the connections were not there all the time. But I met some incredible people and, and it was definitely an, a very interesting time for me. You know, and then I, so I was teaching at the University of California at the time and I was, they were very supportive of, of this type of short term activity. And I came back and I was uh, teaching at uh, UCSB, University of California. And then, you know, the, an interesting shift happened for me. I was teaching, they let me design my own courses in combining educational technology with learning English. So I, I created this course, which was called Communication Through New Technologies. And the idea was that these were very advanced uh, students of English that were coming over as exchange students from various countries. So this is at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And so I was teaching this course that integrated, you know, how to give an effective presentation, how to find online communities. So it was all about the texts that we would read were about online communication. And so we'd read, write, listen, and speak, which are our English skills about these technologies. So it was motivating for the students because, you know, there's just so much happening with the, the internet. I guess it was in 97 and 98 was when I was doing this. But during this one particular course, I remember one day I was looking and trying to, all right, what are we going to read next? And I found this article online about this screen sharing technology. And the idea was, imagine you could be at your home and you could connect to your office computer and you could see the screen and control the computer remotely. It was this technology known back then as buddy help. And I was blown away by the technology and I brought the article in and we read about it. And I think they had some prototype online that we could play with. And the more I got into that particular text with the students, I learned, oh my God, this company is in Santa Barbara. And so I, we played around with the screen sharing. We were just kind of blown away. I mean, that, that technology existed in a different form it, called PC Anywhere. But this was different because this was through the Internet. And imagine seeing and operating somebody else's computer through the Internet. It was like magical to me. So I looked up the company. They were in Santa Barbara. And I remember one night I was sitting at my desk in my tiny apartment. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to send them my resume. And I got a call the next day from one of the founders of the company. And he said, hey, I saw your resume. And you know what? We're looking for a writer. So when I was teaching English, I was kind of the one with like the computer skills. But at this tech company, they saw me for my English abilities. And they said, why don't you come in for an interview? And I'm like, OK. So I go over there. And it's a small company. It was called Expert City, expertcity.com. And it's a, it was a startup. And there were about 14 people there. And they hired me as a writer. So I, I, I switched my career from university to joining this startup. And, and it was a big shift for me. It was like a fork in the road. And I remember I'd been invited to go to Indonesia through the State Department to do another lecture tour. And it was like, all right, do I, do I go there or do I go with these startup people and go on this thing? And so I turned down the trip to Indonesia and I decided, well, I'm blown away by this technology. So I'm just going to go, I want to be with these guys you know, and it was a fun environment and people were very into it. And it was co-founded by a UCSB computer science professor with two of his students. And I thought, all right, who do I want to hang out with all day? Okay, I'll be with these people. And so that was like a big fork in the road for me. And um, what did you write for them initially? Yeah, so expertcity.com, we were creating an online marketplace for tech support. We were trying to be like the eBay of services. So we were a small team. I was the 15th employee and I basically was wrote the words. So if you went to our website, I would write the words. I would partner with the software engineers if they needed uh, text uh, for, you know, inside the applications that we created, like any error messages or you know, pretty much, you know, I converted into a, like an interaction designer. So I worked on UI, UX and any kind of writing. And so that was 
was a really, you know, it was a very motivating and uh, exhilarating time. You know, we created this first product, but after a while, I remember I, I have this photo of myself that I put in some of my talks. I, I'm sitting in my office at Expert City and I've got all these UI flows and printouts of the website on my wall. And one day the CEO came into my office and he said, Heidi, um, this marketplace is not working. Nobody's buying it. We have to stop working on it. And for me, it was really difficult. I was you know, pretty junior in my software career and I didn't really understand. And we had all these hopes and dreams for the software, but uh, they pulled the plug on it because the company was going to go under if we continued that way. And it, at that time, you know, I really didn't understand what was going on. And, and, and the CEO was like, don't start any new work that you think you're going to have to maintain. We're going to have to regroup. Uh, we'll get back to you. So just go to the beach if you don't know of anything to do. And I was like, what do you mean go to the beach? And, um, you know, he was just essentially like, hold tight. We'll let you know the next steps in a few days. And so that's when the one of my first experiences with like a dynamic reteaming situation emerged because the founder of the company, Klaus, Klaus Schauser came to me and said, all right, we have to pivot our company. We're going to create a new team and you're invited to be on this team. And he took people from various existing teams and he pulled us off to the side and he put us in a room and he said, you guys are going to work on a new, a new product. It was actually the original product he wanted to do when founding the company, but it wasn't, I think, attractive enough to investors to, to get the funding originally. But he said, we're going to, we're going to work on something else here. And basically what we're going to do is really go and pursue instead of this marketplace for tech support, we're going to create a a consumer product in which people can uh, access their computers remotely. And essentially we created this product called go to my PC. And so it was like an online way to see and access your computer remotely. Kind of similar to that very early prototype that I saw, but we, we figured out an online commerce flow where people could buy it online or try it. And we essentially um, we're this small team off to the side. So I call it like an innovation by isolation reteaming pattern. So we're a small team put off to the side. We had process freedom from the rest of the existing teams that were at the company. And we were able to iterate and fly and get a, a working version of this software out that became very successful. And, you know, later on, you know, the company survived and later on we went to invent products um, that many people know about today and use today called go to meeting and go to webinar. But I think that shift in the company, that reteaming by isolation to create something really new without any constraints, like, you know, back in the day, this is like early, we were doing waterfall development processes. We had a very heavy uh, design culture. But with this team off to the side, we got to innovate and not do any of that stuff. Everybody else was told to leave us alone. And we were able to like really fly, you know, but it took like, I mean, Klaus has interviews online elsewhere that say, you know, we learned through $10 million that if you're going to start a new company and you're going to build software, you better see if there's a market for it first. So we learned the lesson of market validation. And since then, you know, we've all become students of Steve Blank, Four Steps to the Epiphany. This is the precursor to the Lean Startup book by Eric Reese. So before that movement even started, you know, we in Santa Barbara were implementing some of the ideas from Steve Blank, Four Steps to the Epiphany, by doing market validation. Then we went on to create Go to Meeting, but we validated the market before we, you know, full on built Go to Meeting and go to webinar and go to training and the other products that, that followed on. So I'm curious, um, did you, um, thanks for that, by the way, that's a very, very interesting and well-told um, story. Um, uh, did you eventually move on to being a Citrix employee? Yeah. So after a while, the company was acquired by Citrix. So our startup essentially became Citrix. And so I was there. I was at the company for eight years. And yeah, so then we got, we got acquired by Citrix. And from my perspective, I was on the web development team at that point. I might have become a project manager. I was like a editor, interaction designer, and then I became a technical project manager. So I worked on the first versions of go to meeting, go to webinar, 
go to training as the technical, uh, you know, technical project manager pairing with the product people in the, in the business side of the organization. And I think after we were acquired by Citrix, I believe we released go to meeting if my timeline is straight. And when Citrix acquired us, I think it worked out really well because they left us alone. Like we were really a separate division and we, it felt like the same startup. It felt like the same company. And I have only positive things to say about that shift. Yeah, that's I thought really, it was done. It was done really well. That's, re- that's really interesting because, you know, one of the jokes that goes around is that, you know, the best way to kill a good product is to have a big company acquire it. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, it's really interesting to hear that, you know, they, there may have been some internal understanding when you were acquired, that it was the dynamics that you had on your team. Um, and I guess that's kind of a loaded word in this conversation, but um, uh, <laughs> that, um, uh, you know, were, were part of the success. Um, before, before moving on, I have a couple of questions about that. I actually wanted to circle back briefly to um, the question of market validation. And I'm curious, how, how did you go about validating the market for what eventually became GoToMeeting? Yeah, so there was a point person, and he's a, a, a wonderful colleague. He went on to uh, found a company that's also in Santa Barbara called Product Plan, Jim Semek. So as far as I remember it, so Jim Semek was our lead on market validation. He worked with Klaus Schauser and others, and basically we came, uh, we had a prototype, and it if I recall correctly, it could have been even as simple as a clickable PowerPoint. And it was, it was the idea of having online meetings. And so we had a click, they had a clickable prototype and they would have phone calls with prospective customers for this solution. And basically wanted to find out if we built something like this, would it solve your problems? Are you in enough pain to buy this? If so, what are the types of features that would be useful to you and how much would you pay for it? And the idea is, is to have a bunch of phone calls and we did it with, you know, they did it on the phone. I remember they invited people from the engineering group, myself included, to sit in on these validation calls. So like the development team, we rotated into these calls And there were probably more than 25 calls. And it's important to have the calls with people you don't know. And maybe these are people that I don't even, you know, I'd have to ask Jim how it went down because I don't remember because I was just an attendee in some of these calls. But basically, you know, the idea is talk to prospective users of your product and try to convince yourself that it's not a good idea to continue on. You want to try to see, like, you want to try to prove that this can fail. And if it doesn't fail, then you press on and it's a good idea. And then you get an idea of, okay, if we build this thing and it might look like this, how much would you pay for it? So essentially you sell the concept before you actually build it, but you don't mislead people to think it's ready or anything like that. I mean, it's very clear that we're trying to validate whether or not we should go this route, but it was definitely the you know, four steps, the epiphany and like the guidelines from Steve Blank were really, really key. Steve Blank has a podcast. He interviews Klaus Schauser and he pretty much said that, you know, suddenly he had this demand for his book in Santa Barbara and he talked to his wife and he was like, oh my God, I I think I might be onto something here because suddenly like hundred, you know, we're selling hundreds of books to this, this, you know, person in Santa Barbara named Klaus. And yeah, it was it was very interesting, but basically we, you know, convinced it convinced the company that we should go in this route and you know, the I I can't say enough about like the founders and the leadership of of, you know, Expert City and you know, we came, became a division named Citrix Online uh, back at the time. This was like the first 7 years of that whole experience. They learned, you know, it was like learning about what not to do. They really learned from spending the $10 million on the expertcity.com product that failed. They didn't want to do it again. They wanted to survive. They wanted to keep going. And, um, and so they did. So with the go to meeting and then go to webinar, I think more than a year after we were acquired by Citrix, 
Klaus, one of the founders, left. And after a while, some of the other leadership left. And, you know, one day I noticed that, hey, some of the early developers that I loved working with had started working at another startup, which was an offshoot created by Klaus after he retired, so to speak. He left the first startup and he retired. But after a while, he went and he created another startup, which was the second one I was at. And I was there for nine years. And the second startup was called Appfolio. And what was the um, product from that startup? Yeah. So this was actually also the, that company was founded on the idea of market validation. So Klaus Schauser, founder of Appfolio, partnered with another local entrepreneur named John Walker. So those two co-founders got together and they thought, we're going to build software for auto repair shops. And so what they did is they got together and they did market validation of building software for auto repair shops. You know, you go in, you get your car fixed. What kind of software do they use? They thought there's an opportunity there. I think John had the idea. And so they thought, okay, well, let's see if this would make sense. So they did market validation and they went from auto repair shop to auto repair shop physically in person in Santa Barbara and some other areas. And they convinced themselves, you know what? The auto repair shops are not in enough pain to buy a new software solution for us. We are not going to build software for auto repair shops. So then they had, they had an idea for another type of software. And they thought, oh, property management software. So software for companies that manage rental units for owners. So property management software. And they started market validation for that. And they realized after doing the market validation interviews, I think probably on the phone and in person in this case, that, you know what, a lot of these property management companies are in pain with existing solutions. We think there's an opportunity here to come in and disrupt these people, to disrupt the existing solutions. And so they, they found this in with developing property management software for small business, for small businesses. And so the idea for Appfolio Property Manager was born. And so there was a very small team there. And after a while, they raised some funding. They raised some money. And then I was able to join after they received some funding. And I joined as a scrum master. And how did you make that transition um, from, uh, you know, writing to um, being a, a coach and a scrum master? Yeah. So, you know, in the, in the early years, you know, I was writing and I was doing interaction design. I was doing, I was an individual contributor, you know, within a development team. And after a while, I just started stepping up and becoming a project manager at the first startup. And so I, I think I spent five out of the eight years as a technical project manager and so very, you know, very kind of traditional technical project manager. I mean, I didn't have Gantt charts or anything. I always made flow charts. But it was pretty much I was like a hub of information and trying to, um, you know, more like top-down management. But then the industry shifted, and it was, it was, a, it was a move towards more bottoms-up methods of working with teams. And so, Again, lesson learned from the first startup to the second startup. The founders decided, you know, we're going to start this Appfolio startup and we're going to use extreme programming and Scrum. So it was a business decision to do a different process. You know, extreme programming for the redundancy and sustainability of information and people. At the first startup, we had these towers of knowledge. Like one guy would be in charge of the printer software, for example. If he left, the knowledge left in his head. We didn't want to make that a mistake again at Appfolio. So we wanted that knowledge redundancy. So we paired 100% of the time. And, you know, that was for a while. We had 100% pair programming. And then we relaxed it so people would choose whether they paired or not. But overall, people really pair in that environment. And so, so Pivotal Labs came with our startup. They were with us for more than a year. We had two consultants with us at a time. And so for our very first team, we followed like a pivotal process. So I was hired in as a scrum master, but fulfilled a role of like a, an anchor or tracker in the team. So really helping the team to uh, keep the stories moving within pivotal tracker. It was before it was sold as a product and to help the teams reflect and get better. 
So there was a shift due to a business decision and, and how we worked with Pivotal to have more of a bottoms up approach. So I learned from my Pivotal consultants for more than a year of how to not be a hub and kind of top down project manager to how to be more of a kind of bottoms up servant leader to the team. And so it was a process of acquisition of my skills, I think, of more than a year. But I, you know, I took a Scrum Master course with Ken Schwaber, one of the co-founders of Scrum, you know, just, you know, as a quick two-day thing. But I think really the, the knowledge that I gained from being embedded in an XP team with XP coaches for more than a year is really where I got my education and how I wanted to be. You know, so then I was at Appfolio from one team to 30 teams over a course of nine years. So our process kind of grew and evolved through reflecting on what we wanted to change going forward in our process. Um, slightly switching gears um, before we move on to the subject of your book um, and uh, uh, speaking about improving, um, uh, I saw that you recently gave a workshop on high performance via psychological safety. Um, and there was a reference in the description of this workshop to how psychological safety was very important for high performing teams at Google. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what psychological safety is. Sure. Um, I just, just that gives a little bit of context, actually this, this subject, if I think I'm correct about what it's referring to, um, comes up pretty regularly um, in my podcast interviews. I mean, we have a fair amount of, you know, coaches and agile people and things like that. Um, but it also comes up in discussions about uh, labor generally. Um, and I'm just reminded of um, something I uh, listened to recently on a Slate podcast where it was, you know, guess, guess who in the White House said this? And one of the comments, one of the statements was, what you really want to do to find a winner is throw a bunch of high performing people into a really stress, high stress context and let them fight it out and see who wins. Uh -huh. um, and I know, and, and it's really interesting that, you know, I think one thing we're seeing in our culture happening in like, you know, in the last 20 years with soccer eating the world and the rise of the rise of the importance of like to our global infrastructure of software and software development, you know, methods for managing people's work have this new significance. Um, you know, if we get it wrong, uh, you end up with, you know, let's say making a nationwide uh, healthcare um, service that blows up in everybody's faces and causes, you know, something worse than a scandal. Um, and so I was wondering if, 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 as you discuss psychological safety, if you could maybe, I you know, just wanted to have that context there to the discussion mm -hmm. of how important managing uh, software development is in our time. Yeah, I, I think if I could like really bottom line this topic, it would be what W. Edwards Deming said, which is drive fear out of the workplace. You know, a leader's job is to remove fear. And so we want to be able to show up fully at work. We want to be ourselves. We want to be able to make mistakes, try things out you know, safe to fail experiments. We want to be able to ask questions. We want to be able to, you know, bring up a problem if one exists. We want to really operate full, you know, bring our full selves and, and, and be able to operate fully in our environments. You know, we want to have like full participation from all of the people that we bring together on these teams. And so I think how people show up as managers and as leaders and as good coworkers is really important. You know, am I able to do my best work or am I editing myself because I'm afraid of what Joe over there is going to say to me if I express my opinions? So it's kind of like, how can we remove obstacles out of the way of all the human beings so they can fully contribute not be afraid and that it can be an enjoyable experience. You know, so of course, you know, we have to ensure that we're, you know, building the right things that are validated, you know, the right things for our customers. And we want to deliver at a cadence that delights them and everything. So, you know, all that market validation stuff is one thing, you know, but, you know, so like modern agile, right. 
we need to make safety a prerequisite. And we talk about that. Joshua Kiriewski, uh, you know, one of the, the main drivers for the modern agile movement, you know, we want to make safety a prerequisite. And one part of having awesome teams, you know, making people awesome, having awesome teams that deliver the right things continuously to customers is we feel comfortable in our work to really bring our all, to not have any kind of strange inter- interpersonal obstructions in our way. So, you know, you know, so how can we do that with our teams? You know, we need to kind of really read the emotional field of what's going on in our teams in that, are you in a meeting? Are you in a planning meeting? And the conversation is dominated by two people and everybody else is silent. Hmm. What's going on there? You know, it could be a variety of things, but do these people feel safe to speak up? You know, we get curious when we notice pockets of silence in our teams, because it could be a sign that maybe something isn't safe or maybe that the team is too big and maybe we need to split it in two, which is a very common pattern written about in the book called the mitosis pattern. You know, but we need to, you know, we need to, you know, really come from the sense of how are the people doing? Are they able to contribute fully? Is it an environment that is really stimulating and allowing people to bring their best? Or are people editing themselves because they're afraid? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And does, um, I mean, particularly with the example of Google, who are sort of well known for gathering, trying to gather data um, on uh, employee performance, does does the presence of the idea that, you know, we're analyzing the data help make people feel safe, um, you know, in their in their work environment? I'm just curious about that dynamic, because, you know, it, it, I can see in a, in a scenario where someone's like, oh, I'm not just being subjectively judged by, you know, my boss. Um, uh, my boss can't undermine me um, for interpersonal reasons, because, you know, there's an objective process here. Is that, does, is that something that plays a role? Because, I mean, you mentioned emotion, but emotion can, you know, is this inherently, um, subjective thing that's of course very important, but the mm-hmm. more subjective, I just, I just sort of floating the idea that the more subjective things get, um, the less secure someone might feel because it starts to appear arbitrary. Yeah, actually, you know, that idea of how how am I what does success look like in my role and how am I evaluated in my company? People have performance reviews are very common in different companies. If you go back to Deming, and I think he originally wrote this book in 1983. It's called Out of the Crisis. He talks about performance reviews being one of the components that creates a lot of fear in the workplace, and you know so. And I know that I think a lot of companies have good intentions, but, you know, sometimes even with that, we can be unskillful in how we deploy these types of things. You know, we want to, we want to feel like we want to make a difference in the work that we do. We need to know what success looks like in our roles. And, you know, you know, frankly, I, I would try to take it to the team level, like how, what does success look like for our team? Okay, team, like, let's talk about that. What, what is our success criteria for how we work together and what we do? And, you know, engaging the team and coming up with ways that they measure their own success. So these are like metrics for the team by the team, as opposed to somebody else from outside trying to come in and judge the team maybe using, maybe they're too far away to do anything useful. You know, I'm not a fan of metrics that roll up. I, you know, it's, it's a very, uh, it's a very sticky or murky area. Um, but I do think it's great to engage teams to talk with each other about, okay, we have, you know, what is our baseline and how do we want to get better as a team? So how do we as a team want to measure ourselves? And then maybe we want to try experiments to get better as a team and then take a look a little bit later and compare to our benchmark. Did we get better or not? Uh, so I, I prefer kind of stuff like that, that, you know, metrics that are by the team for the team that help them get better in a way that they agree on. It's interesting when you talk about the, um, the problems that can come with an outsider uh, coming in, you have a phrase I think I saw on your website of um, 
poorly done foreign aid. Um, <laughs> I really love that that metaphor. You know, it reminds me of um, an example I, I heard of. Uh, you know, I mean, this is pretty common, but you know, one problem that can happen with foreign aid is people can kind of you know drop the food in on parachutes, and then the local strongman grabs it um, and uh, you know only and sells it to people, even though it was meant to be distributed for free. Um, and, you know, it's just an, an example of how, you know, good intentions uh, and maybe pro and in this, ex you know, in this um, uh, context, it might be providing people with all these great tools um, doesn't necessarily work if it's not deployed properly and with an understanding of what things are actually like on the ground. Mm -hmm. And what they actually need. And actually that phrase, poorly done foreign aid, goes back to my aid work with the State Department, because when I went to the Malaysian Ministry of Education and I did a workshop on, you know, how to create websites, I remember I got into the room and I was with the participants in the computer lab and I gave my opening and what or whatever. And I had just assumed that the participants would choose the area of the website that they wanted to work on. And after I gave my intro, one of the leaders stepped up. And he went around the room and he said, you will do this part, you will do this part, you will do this part, and you will do this part. And the, the learning that I got from, and, and, it, and I was like, oh, thinking to myself, oh, okay, this is how it's going to go down. All right, I'll just go with it. Because the leader had a certain idea of how he wanted this to be organized. And the lesson that I learned from that was that I had made an assumption. I had made an assumption coming in that they would be organized the way that I thought was appropriate as an outsider, not necessarily the way that might have worked best for them. And so I discovered it through that process. And I learned that, you know, I really need to do a, a, a needs analysis when I go into these contexts so that I can be in alignment and on the same page with the leaders and with the people and, you know, try to deploy the best solutions. And so, you know, I, I talk about poorly done foreign aid for some of this other stuff because it's like, you know, a consultant or agile person or whoever excited engineer might come in and try to get a team to do something, but it might be completely inappropriate for what they need. So I think it's really, really important to, you know, be with the people, acknowledge, you know, however we're working right now, there's certain things about it that undoubtedly work really well. So if we visualize where we are today, agree to a, pursue incremental improvement or, you know, the quest for getting better and engage with the people on what that might look like, I think you'd have greater success and less of a chance of trying to, you know, bestow upon a team a solution that makes no sense for what they're going through. So that kind of, t it actually ties it back to what I was saying before. But yeah, I mean, a poorly done foreign aid, I don't want to do it. And, you know, I can see it when it's done. And a lot of the times people have really, really good intentions. And I think, you know, the, the bottom line learning there is, you know, get in touch with the people and what they need, start where they are, and then go from there. Um, moving on to the subject of your book, uh, Dynamic Reteaming. Um, I know you could talk about this for hours, um, but um, I guess maybe we could focus in on um, uh, just as an example of is the mitosis pattern that you invoked earlier. And if you could talk a little bit about, you know, what that pattern is, why, why this mitosis uh, happens, why it, why it's, why it can be good if it's managed properly and whether, you know, at, at what cadence, you know, this sort of team division should proceed. Oh, yeah, sure. I would love to. So uh, this might, so all of the patterns in my book are derived from data. And so the mitosis patterns happens to be one of the most uh, common patterns that I've encountered. And when I call something a pattern, it's because I've seen it three or more times. So I mean, the fact is, when our teams get, I'm talking software development teams now, when our software develop, and that's the, the teams in the book, when the teams get to a certain size, when they get bigger, maybe it means more than seven people on the team, seven or more. Um, typically, I think I've seen around maybe from 10 to 13 is when splits happen. When teams get kind of big, stuff gets harder. It's harder to make decisions. It's harder to hold meetings and have retrospectives because you need to change your facilitation so there's more equal participation with all the people. If you have a discussion with four people, 
you don't really need to like break, break out any sticky notes or anything. Typically the conversation kind of flows because there's less communication channels. When you get bigger to like 10, 13, some people say more than seven, you know, you might notice that things are harder. Standups take longer. It's more painful to come to decisions. Maybe you have those pockets of silence on the team where you all try to meet together because that's what you're used to doing, but only three people talk. So then it becomes like, how can we make the meeting more engaging? And there's certain facilitation things you can do to try to, you know, work in pairs and then share out. But it seems that naturally teams just start to split. And then things become easier. I was just with a team today at a client site that just split today. And it's almost a forcing function for having, you know, less work in progress as well. So you might see on a big team, if it's a software development team that has software engineers and typically one QA person on the team, if they're working in such a way that they have to pass through the QA person before they get the software out to deployment, that QA person will be crunched because there's multiple streams of work coming to that person. Well, that's a lot it's lessened when you split because there's just less work in progress and there's other ways to solve that, but yeah. Yeah. And I imagine it's highly context dependent, but for example, you know, if, if you're, if you've got a team of 14 people and you decide, okay, it's time to do some kind of split, how do you decide who goes where? And, and I guess like, how is that decision making process surfaced, you know, best, you know, do you give people a sense of some, um, power in the decision that's being made like do they have input in you know i i really like working with so and so we really get along maybe you haven't noticed you know how does i'm just curious about how that process works i mean imagine it's normally not best to just show up one day and say hey everybody we're splitting you in two u7 over here u7 over there Mm -hmm. yeah so i think typically someone notices that there are maybe two or more missions at play or areas of work that we could do. So someone has the idea that, hey, I think we should split the teams, or I've noticed things are hard. If we split the teams, team A can work on this feature, team B could work on this feature. Let's say you have feature teams, just for simplicity, you have, you have a bunch of feature teams. And so someone, you know, people might start talking, you know, maybe a tech lead or a manager or coach someone, uh, one of the engineers that, There's two distinct sets of work, and if we divide the team in half, it could be easier. So there's like some noticing at that kind of more macro level. But then it's like, okay, well, how do we get the people on the teams? And there's different ways to do that, and they have different levels of transparency. So, you know, one way, a way that I like a lot is doing self-selection where, all right, we have these these two areas of work and we'd like every, you can facilitate an activity where everybody is together and talk with people about, all right, we need probably, you know, if we have eight engineers, maybe we'll have four on each team. Um, We'd like you guys to, to figure out who wants to be on each team and they can do an activity, putting themselves as avatars on two regions of a whiteboard and they can figure it out. There's a book called Creating Great Teams by Sandy Mamoli and David Mole that I usually point people to because it gives a very tactical how-to. If you want to engage, you know, 50 teams in a self-selection activity, how do you do it? Uh, so, so they have great kind of tactical guidelines. So, you know, I don't know. Freedom is a value of mine. I like to give people choice. I think people get more motivated when they have the freedom to choose where they want to work. And it's really a sweet spot when the company matches that, right? So when the company feels like they'd be good there and they would be good there too. And so there's stories in the book about um, different, you know, self-selection stories. And really, you know, it might be like, there's a story in the book, you know, I was talking to Christian Linwall. He's an engineering site lead at Spotify in San Francisco. So he was working with a tribe And a tribe consists of, let's say, four to five squads or teams. And they noticed at one point that some of the missions were overlapping and they really had to reset the missions for each of these squads. So they came up with a graphic and they put it on a whiteboard. So they said, "Okay, we we think we're going to have these five squads and these are the missions. 
and people were able to explain what the missions were. And then they engaged the whole group and they took all the names off of the squads and they engaged the group in, all right, which squads do you want to be a part of? And after a period of two weeks, after an initial kickoff, they had one-on-one discussions, people put their preferences. It was all very visible because it was in a whiteboard and a common, uh, like visible during their coffee hour uh, period called a FICA. And so they figured out the teams in a very visible way. And if somebody was working on something already for like four months, they still take their name off the squad because that person might want to change. They might want to change a pace and do something different. So I think um, these visible ways of reteaming that enable people to have choice, that don't put people in a box like, oh, he does that. He's the printer guy. You know, that printer guy might be sick of the printer. So let him choose something else. So I think that's really important. You know, the polar opposite of that is what I've also seen in other contexts is when somebody assigns the teams and you're put on a team and you don't even know who put you on a team because there's, it's so abstract. I was just going to ask you, um, one of the principles that you discuss, um, is avoiding abstraction. Um, Mm -hmm. and I wanted to just, you know, dig in a little deeper into what that's going on about. I mean, it's, 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 um, because it sounds like, you know, defining, defining missions, for example, might be a place where that principle would apply, you know, achieve synergies or something like that, yeah. you know, deploy deliverables. Um, you know, is, is that, is that what you mean when you're talking about avoiding abstraction, having not only something that's kind of too generic and something that's too disconnected from what's actually being done, but also something that, you know, comes from the outside rather than the inside. I think, um, like in some of the writing in the book so far, again, you know, the book is alive, which is a nice thing about Lean Pub. Um, in terms of avoiding abstraction, it's kind of related to if if the company is so large or, or is working in such a way that the, the team members are assigned and reassigned by somebody far away, generally you have communication problems. I was with a, I was with a company that as a consultant that every quarter they'd reset their priorities of work and suddenly people would be disappearing from the teams because their manager told them they got reassigned to this other team. And then the team that they left, they didn't even say goodbye. So it was like a sudden reteaming by abstraction by somebody like really far away. And so, you know, the proximity just isn't there and the caring just isn't there. And, you know, I think, again, it could have everybody could have really great intentions, but we can be unskillful in, in doing these things, especially if we're dealing with a great number of teams and the decisions about who is on what team are made from far away. I think, you know, if you if you're closer to the team, if there are more local decisions of uh, uh, of this kind of thing, it's it's generally more understandable by the people that are impacted. Um, on the subject of uh, living book, um, I think the last I checked, your book is about seventy percent complete. Um, and and have you been? I'm just curious about how your your approach to in progress publishing. So have you been adding stories as they come in from people? Yeah. So basically, I have a flow, and the flow is so I. It's kind of like linguistic research. You know, you get a data set and you analyze it for the patterns, and then you write about the patterns. So I I interview people from different companies all over the world for an hour about how their teams have changed over the years. And I have a very general prompt, kind of do an interview, and then I get it transcribed. And then I read the transcription, I listen to it, and I code it for themes, and I see what's present there. Does something in their stories support an existing pattern, or does it suggest a new one? And then I integrate their stories into the book. So like right now, I think I, I have kind of a a, a pileup. So I have probably like eight transcriptions that I need to analyze and get into the book. And I'm trying to work in small batches so that I integrate something. Like I just, I just added an isolation pattern. It's on my computer, but hasn't been uploaded to LeanPub yet. So I have an isolation pattern story that I've integrated in. I went over the data over the weekend and there's some compelling stuff to add to the book. So I'm trying to keep it small and then release it, you know, small batches, just like, you know, we try to advocate in small in software development. You want to work small so you can have more of a continuous uh, release and you can 
continuous deployment. Mm -hmm. You get, you get in trouble when your batches get really big and then you release a big chunk. So I had that like last month I had a big batch problem. I let it get the best of me, but if I can work in these small chunks and then continue, continually, continually release, I think it's better for everybody. Um, but I don't want to annoy my readers and update them too much with email. So there's a, there's a, you guys have a warning that says, you know, watch out, you know, don't be maybe sending an email every day. I don't want to spam people. Oh my God, there's totally a snake. Uh, I got a rattlesnake right there. A the rattlesnake. Scam. He's like, a. um, I'm going to go inside. Yeah, that might be a good idea. Yeah, it's either a king snake or a rattlesnake. I am outside in California and it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, you want to work in small batches and continue, continuously release them. That being said, I have been trying to go more global with my data. And so I am looking for participants. Like I'm, I'm trying to schedule a call with a, a someone I met from Italy so I can get a different global perspective. I have a map and I have points on the map of where all the participants are from. And so I'm, I'm also looking for some participants from Asia. There's a lot of kind of California, Europe. I've got Iceland, New Zealand. And so I'm trying to go more global with my data set. And, you know, I frankly, I'm really enjoying this whole process because it's a process of discovery. So it's really about, you know, I mean, there is an outcome of this, which is the book and people can get it on lean pub, but I'm, it's, it's really a delightful process of learning and speaking the whole of, thing. It's all emergent. Yeah. That's really, that's really, um, interesting. Speaking of, um, uh, process um you not only have your um email address you know a bit uh presented i think in the introduction to your book but you actually have it in the footer um all the way along so uh no matter where anyone is in their book they're being invited to give feedback and i was wondering if you've been getting feedback from people and how that process has worked for you you know frankly i i i've been getting feedback from some people like i think there's like early adopters or people that are really into it that are giving me feedback. I get feedback when I give talks. I created a Slack channel that I think I advertise once in the email, but it's still kind of an up and coming Slack channel. It doesn't have much traffic. I, I, I would like more feedback, you know, pretty much I get the feedback when I ask for it. And, um, yeah, I think people are busy, you know, maybe they don't have time unless you like kind of build a relationship and ask for feedback. I do iterate with uh, participants. Like, for example, the, the isolation story I just wrote is, is about the story of uh, the development of uh, a team within large Citrix after I left. Citrix as an enterprise has a reteaming story where they created this app called Convoy. So this innovation by isolation pattern. So I wrote up the story and I'm you know, kind of validating uh, that, I, that I got it right with the participant who I interviewed. So I iterate with the participants for sure, just for accuracy. And yeah, I, I kind of would like more feedback. And I think that's, that's something to look into. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that suggestion. Um, uh, it's something that we know we can do a lot more work around. Um, and it is it is really an interesting moment um, in publishing generally where, you know, feedback can take place. And this has been true for some time technically, but, you know, people are getting more accustomed and we, we see it on LeanPub with the idea of authors and readers interacting um, in a very productive way. Um, and, you know, in particular um, with something like, you know, the way LeanPub books are so easy to update, you know, a re reader loves it if they sort of make a suggestion, you know, hey, I found a typo on page 72 and, you know, it's fixed in the next release. Um, mm -hmm. they, they, it gives them a sense of, you know, personal contribution. And, um, you know, they don't, it's sort of the opposite of someone feeling like they're doing work for someone else for free. You know, mm -hmm. they feel like they're actually participating in improving something. And the process itself, if we can make it, you know, better, it can be something that really, not only gives people a positive experience, but actually improves the quality of the work that's done. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my second last question is, um, uh, how did you find out about LeanPub um, in the first place to choose to use it if you, if you 
happen to recall? I'm always curious to find yeah. out about that. Uh, yeah, one of my friends uh, suggested it. Yeah, he's a uh, yeah, one of my friends suggested it that I I get a lean pub that I that I do a lean pub. He's also in the software industry. Okay. And so that was in the back of my mind and then I figured out a flow. I use Scrivener on a Mac. And I learned about Scrivener from him as well. And yeah, I just kind of figured out a flow to export my Scrivener into a Dropbox. And everything's in markup in my Scrivener. I converted it to, or Markdown, sorry. Yeah. Is it Markdown? Yeah. Markdown. Converted it to, yeah. <laughs> to Markdown. And I've, I've got a, you know, I've got a, I've got a flow that goes to LeanPub and then, you know, I'll kind of generate the previews and check them out. So I've got a pretty good flow. It, it's somewhat manual, like it could be automated, but like scripted, but it works really well and I'm really happy with it. And I feel safe with having my book on my computer and also in lean pub and then uh also in dropbox you know and all these like i've got three copies of my book so i feel really safe about it like i'm not going to lose it yeah that's a really interesting um process um uh you know it's always curious to hear about you know because uh, partly because so many lean pub authors are technical they just really love optimizing how they do things um, yeah i should mention when it comes to safety we've got a, a somewhat hidden feature um, called versions that you can see. And it's one of the menu items in your book tools um, mm -hmm. where when you, whenever you preview or publish, we actually save the manuscript. Um, oh. So it's this extra level of um, security. And, you know, someday, you know, we'll add more features like, you know, give a name to it, uh, mm -hmm. to the version um, rather than just a date, which is what we, what we currently store. Um, and then you can imagine, you know, release notes being automatically generated from, you know, or a change log or something like that from, oh, cool. from, you know, there's, so there's, there's all sorts of really fun, you know, paths for us to go down in the future, but I'm glad yeah. I, I'm, 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 you know, that, that was a particular hobby horse of mine because, you know, what you're just talking about, you know, that sort of sense of security from having your writing stored in various locations mm -hmm. is something that, I mean, you know, some people might worry about more than others. And I think I worry about it myself more than others. Um, um, yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I, it feels good. You know, I, I really, really, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful for, for all of it. I think it's a great, I, I love lean pub. I, I, I love what you guys have set up oh, well, thanks. I, I re and I really mean it. I think it, it's, it's been really, really, uh, a great experience for me. Well, thanks. Thanks very much for that. Um, uh, my last question, um, on that note is, um, uh, as good as I, I suppose it, it may be, and it's battle hardened and it's taken a long time to get here. Um, uh, you yeah. know, working with, with authors over the years, but if there were one magic feature we could build for you, um, does anything come to mind? Is there something that was maybe, you know, other than maybe stuff we've talked about around feed around feedback or maybe automating, is there something, you know, that you found yourself wishing you had that we don't provide community. Community. Like a reader community, mm -hmm. like if, uh, you know, so that email that I send out with version notes or, Hey, guess what? New version. It goes to all these people. And I think, I don't even know how many readers I have anymore, but there's a certain number of readers. Like it would be great if those readers could opt in to some kind of community or opt in for, to have discussions about the book or something. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's that's some that's a direction that we're being pulled in more and more. And I think it's partly because um, we've kind of got the process so sort of stable now uh, mm -hmm. of making a book and releasing new versions that people are like, well, now it's the community around it um, where we should perhaps be focusing our efforts. And yeah, it's something that we've actually thought a lot about. Um, and it's something that we do intend to address. You know, I, I can't make any time yeah. promises, but you know, things, even simple things like, you know, getting a notification in LeanPub rather than only an email. So that if you're in LeanPub, you might see a little, you know, the little red circles that we see everywhere now with the number going up. Um, and then you can check and see, oh, you know, there's a communication from the author that's not as necessarily as intrusive as an email might be, but might make more sense as a notification in LeanPub. And then can you have a place where you can go where people can themselves participate in a discussion around a book? 
um, things like that. So it's definitely something that we're thinking about. Um, well, I, I wanted to say, Heidi, thanks uh, very much for taking the time to do this interview. Um, I had a lot of fun. It's the first time uh, there's been a, an adventure with a snake um, <laughs> when I've interviewed someone, um, uh, which I must say you dealt with with um, a plume. Um, uh, and um, uh, I also wanted to say thank you for being a Lean Pub author. And if there's anything we can ever do to help you out, uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Keep up the great work. I love what you guys have created. It's really empowering. Thanks.